Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Alex Bunt. I am a reference and instruction librarian here at Bryn Mawr College. And um, today, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be introducing the, the, the uh, current session, which is um, titled A Blended Approach to Idea-Centered Learning. Um, this session will be um, presented by three professors from Smith College who will be sharing their experiences of taking a blended learning approach uh, to knowledge building with a tool called Knowledge Forum and address the challenges and um, of blended learning uh, and the utility of this approach to facilitating collaborative learning, metacognition, and idea-centered learning. Um, so those uh, three professors are um, Professors Patricia DeBartolo, Lauren Duncan, and Glenn Ellis. Um, so without further ado, uh, take it away. Wow. I've never begun like that. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I hope we're going to do is pick up upon where we were this morning with the keynote. But the keynote was very provocative. And I also think the questions at the end of the keynote were really fantastic. And so two questions come to mind right away for me is one question was from the physicist from Amherst was um, this really seems to be aimed at lower level learning. What about the higher end of learning? Well, that's what our presentation is all about. And another great question I thought was um, well, what about communities? How can you use technology to support discourse and community? Well, our presentation is all about discourse and community. And so we know from uh, cognitive science, one of the most powerful tools we have as a teacher is getting students to talk to each other, particularly talking about kind of the edge of what they know. And so our presentation is about trying to support quality student discourse, and a particular type of discourse called knowledge building. Okay, so knowledge building, we want the students to do is engage in discourse where they're continually working to improve each other's ideas. And um, this is actually an interna international organization involved in knowledge building. But we have a, a conference in Italy in September um, the very first week of our classes, I'll, I'll be there. And uh, so it's an international organization. It's being done around the world, many, many places, except for in particular the United States. So the United States does not participate very much in this. And in particular, it's more about K-12 than higher education. Yet the research shows it seems to be one of the most powerful tools that we know from the learning sciences in terms of supporting deep learning. So our talk is all about that. There we go. OK, and so an overview, I'm going to talk a little bit to start with about what does it mean to learn the knowledge age? And then Pat is going to follow it up and actually show you some discourse in which has to talk about discourse and evaluate and so forth. And then Lauren's going to follow that again with more discourse, but in this case, discourse that happens in the classroom in the form of students talking with a video. And then it can be back to me again, and I'll be talking about how do you actually scaffold this. It's a crazy thing. So we want students to engage in discourse where they're the leaders and they're taking control. But yet, how do we actually help them do it? It's a very tricky thing to navigate. And finally, we have a few outcomes to share. We're still gathering outcomes. We'll, sh we'll share a few. Our plan is to have lots of time for discussion throughout and at the end. So that's the overall game plan. I'm going to start with a, with a uh, very challenging puzzle, which is, if you saw this sign, would you park there? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I looked at it for a while, and I, I, I would probably park there and get towed, and that kind of person. But um, <laughs> this is kind of what it's like now in the knowledge age. So what are our students' experience? So what does it mean to teach an age where everything you want to know is online, but in a forum which is not very useful and contradicts each other, is unreliable, and so forth? And so in some ways, what our students are working on is um, it's called transliteracy, which is taking complicated different bits of information, kind of putting them together to, to form that makes sense. In this case, give all this information, should I park there or not? And here's a form I use when I talk to students about this. Um, so for some reason, our students really like the idea of getting a job at Google, which I understand all. I'm not a fan of Google like, like they are. And Thomas Friedman did an article on this about a year ago, which I shared with my students. And so what he did is he interviewed Laz, Laszlo Bach, who's the senior vice president for operations at Google, and asked him, what are you looking for when you hire someone. So our students, they're very interested in this topic. And what we basically did was totally trash colleges in general and say GPA is worth us and all sorts of stuff. And so eventually Thomas Freeman got to, well, what do you look for? Well, here's what they look for. Number one thing they're looking for is cognitive ability. And something that, that there is, is learning ability. 
And so our students will be in a world they need to learn all the time, and particularly ability process on the fly, pull together disparate pieces of information. Basically, they should know kind of park there or not. So the, the, the Google recognizes that this transliteracy thing is a gigantic um, piece of information for the future in, in terms of our graduates. And the second thing they say is, they're also looking for leadership, and then they go on to trash traditional leadership. It doesn't really matter if you're president of the chess, chess club. What they're interested in, if you are part of a group of working on a knowledge problem, and every knowledge problem is by definition incredibly messy and complicated, are you a person who sits there looking confused as the rest, or are you a person who takes the lead and dives right in and gets things moving? You know when to step in the lead, when to, when to go in the other's lead, and so forth. That's what Google is looking for. And in terms of um, some of the jargons with this, these are often referred to as 21st century skills. I know from the presentation this morning that um, Cooper College did, they have all, the handout was all about these kind of 21st century skills. So I think we're all interested in this in one way or the other. We all agree that it'd be really great if our students can find information and process it and solve problems and communicate. And I think most of all is that last one, which is they're continuing to be learning throughout their life. And so how do we help our students do this? All right. And a couple of different schools of thoughts on this. Um, on the right, you see the learning sciences. This is a big issue in the learning sciences. How do we support students learning deeply in the knowledge age? And the, the learning sciences call kind of everybody else a group of under futuristic business, which is kind of a derisive way of talking about everybody else. But here's the big difference between these two schools of thought. Um, the side on the left says, well, if we want to learn skills like finding knowledge and creativity and so forth, what we've got to do is teach them to be creative. Teach them to find knowledge. Whereas, and, and so if you want to become an expert in history, don't focus so much on history. Focus more on learning the 21st century skills to access and evaluate all the information out there about history. The learning sciences says it's actually the exact opposite of that. And there's a whole lot of uh, research showing that when you ignore content mastery and deep learning, that really terrible things happen. And it's quite dangerous having students working with information when they don't really understand it deeply. And so the learning sciences says is if you want your students to learn these 21st century skills, what you want to do is get them involved in a project that involves deep learning. And, and, and by doing that, they will then learn these skills in a way which will make sense and can be processed. In some sense, my guess is in this room, we are all pretty good overall at these 21st century skills. And we got that by caring passionately about subject area exploring in depth, and along the way, we learn these things. So the learning sciences feel very strongly that's the way to go about learning 21st century skills. And what we're interested in particular is called knowledge building, which is getting students involved in a discourse where they explore questions that they care passionately about and explore them very deeply, and they get involved in the discourse. And a lot of discourse can be really horrible. Students don't always like discourse. It can be unproductive. What the learning sciences says is, Discourse in which students are constantly improving ideas is some of the best discourse to have. And so what we're talking about today is knowledge building where we are looking at ways that we can help students get involved in really powerful discourse in which they improve ideas. The results are two things. One is they're going to learn their subject very deeply. And two is they would then also develop these 21st century skills. So that's what we're all about. Um, so let's start thinking about what is discourse and what does good discourse look like. Um, back to the Freeman article, if you look at the upper right there, it says there are 296 comments. How many people are like me and feel compelled to actually go and look at those comments? And, and overall, we say they're good, bad? Bad. Bad, okay. And, and so let's get to discourse. What's the positive here? Well, the positive is about half the people in the room raise their hand and say, wow, this is a really powerful thing. I just can't resist. And I have to go look at them. So for example, if we clicked on it, here was the very first comment by Judge Roy being the, the dog. And um, <laughs> there's something really powerful where I have to go into that. And now I'm both a bunch of people who care about the same thing. And we're having this discourse about something I really care about. So something really good going on there. But when I said, is this good or bad, I heard bad. What, why do you think it's bad or why do you think it's good? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Maybe others might have wanted to say good. 
my experience in the comics uh, come from film form spaces and uh, tend to reinforce a, a certain ideological bias. I don't really seem to be committed to actually discoursing, but rather just voicing the opinion. Beautifully said. And which pretty much describes how our students start knowledge building. They do the exact same thing. They're not listening. They're not putting upon ideas. They're not using authoritative sources. Great points. Any other thoughts on this kind of discourse? Yes. Uh, I sort of, in the New York Times, I find the comments often more interesting than the article because I think the readers often have like a lot of knowledge and great ideas to bear on to sometimes bring the personal experience in. And I feel really enriched by reading the New York Times comments. Many other places the comments I feel are pathetic. Yes. But in the New York Times, I think they're really wonderful for the most part. And I also like seeing how they're, like, how they're ranked and what, what other readers found yeah. to be the most interesting yeah. comments. It's, it's, a, it's a really power, even, it's not perfect, but even here where a lot goes wrong, like you said, it's still a really powerful thing in terms of learning. Yes. I really like seeing what is important to different people even if a comment is silly or really politically charged or, you know, I kind of want to push back or something, what I see in those is um, the, the overall message to each individual, or, you know, the majority of readers felt that these three things are the most important thing. And sometimes they'll focus on really nitpicky things, and other times they start bringing in links to other blogs. And so it's, it's a resource, but it's also a way to take a measurement of the kind Absolutely. of people accessing the site. Great point. And I think another thing that's key to knowledge building is getting a diversity of ideas. And so we do, you definitely get a diversity of ideas in these situations. Maybe, maybe like one more thought, anybody? Yeah. I mean, maybe not in New York Times so much, but other sources to get people who are purposely being belligerent in order to cause strife and maybe even emotional pain in other people too. So modeling some very um, disturbing discourse mostly because they're anonymous. Yeah, it's a lot of hatred goes on. But also what you're saying, too, is that, that knowing so social skills are a really big part of collaborative learning and working in knowledge resistance and so forth. So another big part of knowledge building is learning how to post and, sh and your share your ideas in such a way that invites people to then add on and build upon your ideas. And so it's something that could take, use a lot of work, I think, in stuff like this. Well, Patty is going to continue on um, talking about discourse some more. So maybe I can just start some introductory comments, which is that we, so the technology that we're using here is in many ways, you can see it's, it's very basic. There is nothing flashy or fancy about it. We sometimes talk about it as being akin to sticking a post-it note of an idea up on a board where people can then connect their ideas and their post-it notes of comments and questions and misunderstandings and knowledge gaps in collaboration with one another. So we, when we, I'm going to show you what the software looks like, but there's nothing really compelling here. You, you would say, this seems so, like, so much fun. It really truly is um, very simple. It allows those students to connect their ideas in interesting ways, non-linear ways. So on the New York Times comments, for example, you can't, if, comment number 125 is the same or similar to comment number 333, there's no way to put them near each other or to connect them somehow in the conversation. And knowledge form allows more um, flexibility with the way that clusters of ideas develop in relation to one another. But the important thing here is that our use of technology is driven by a principle. And the principle, again, is the principle of discourse, that our students need to be able to talk with one another in productive ways about messy, complicated problems where there's not a clear right answer where they really need to pull on their collective expertise and knowledge base and engage fully with the material from the class in order to make some headway. And we do this um, on Knowledge Form and use it for students to do that asynchronously outside of the classroom. And we use it as well so that in the classroom we hope that their discourse will be better. Because I think I heard some chuckles in the audience about discourse and good discourse. I think we've all had the experience that you think you have this really juicy question you pose to the class, expecting all kinds of wonderful conversation and dialogue, and it goes, it doesn't go very well at all. From your perspective, even if students are really passionately engaged with the question, you feel like they're somehow missing the crux of what it is you're trying to do. So we're going to talk about how it is we, um, we use knowledge form for good discourse. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how I've done it in my psychology classes. I'm a professor of psychology. I use this approach in my intro to research methods. 
class, which is really a bedrock class for the whole entire discipline. It's about critical thinking. It's about understanding how psychologists understand the world. Um, and so using that methodology is really important. And uh, I have a quote up here from Lillian Feldadal about how unnatural it is to think scientifically, that we often tend to focus on our opinions and ideas and beliefs, et cetera, or to look at a bit of information and somehow reify it without understanding the strengths and weaknesses to it. So for this particular class, I think for many of our classes, it's really important that students can hold an idea at arm's length and think about what is the strength of the idea, what are the weaknesses to it, how would I push it further along, et cetera. So we use knowledge forum, forum for this purpose. Um, I try to engage students with a messy real world problem. A lot of my students, Smith is a woman's college, um, many students are really interested, have an, have an interest in uh, women's well-being, eating disorders, and media influences. So we start off the beginning of the semester with a knowledge problem, which is that I tell them, we want to think about, I want to build on your ideas about what do we know about mass media's messages and their influence on women's sense of self in our culture. And what we do is we use that as the organizing question for my research methods course. And what we do is we circle about that using different kinds of research designs and tools. So observational studies, correlational studies, experimental studies. How do we understand this question using those different tools and methodology? We start off the beginning of the semester where students write down their ideas. So they write an essay. So don't look at any sources. I just off the top of your head, what do you think about this question? And then we re revisit it all over the whole entire semester. And it becomes what we spend our time talking about. So we use this problem of media messages. And students all have really big opinions about this. Um, and you're going to see some of the discourse from the beginning of the semester to a later unit to see what those kind of um, naive views when they come into the classroom, what they look like. And then what we do is we learn all the particular details, uh, the definitions of construct validity and, and test retest reliability, um, et cetera, and the, the um, weaknesses to or the potential threats to internal validity and try to layer that upon our understanding of as we try to answer this question with research methods tools, what do we now know about this particular question? So they need to become experts in using the language and vocabulary of the class. And in that process, they also begin to learn about a positivistic approach to science because they start to see there's never one perfect approach. We never prove anything in science. We just um, seem to move ourselves in a particular direction, et cetera. So all these things get interwoven together in a course. So here's Knowledge Forum. We actually, in our materials online, we have directions for you to go on and play with Knowledge Forum and what it looks like. But again, it's really easy to learn. The tutorial takes about five minutes in class. And here's what it looks like at the beginning. When they first sign on, so this assignment was put up your ideas about what you think about that question at the very beginning of the semester. So I told my students to do that. You need to post um, your ideas, and then you need to respond to a couple of posts. By the time we meet next, I want you to get used to the technology. So when they, the first student li logs on, it's a blank space. And then what they do is they hit the button up on top that is the pencil, and then a box will open, and they just type their ideas in the box. And then they hit OK, and this is what pops up. It's a little, it's a little uh, post-it, in essence. It has a title and the student's name underneath. Then another student comes on and connects it. Ah, I read your post. I have this question or comment and reaction. So you can actually see a blue arrow connecting those two. The one that's pointing to it is a response to the first. That's building on. So, and then a cluster begins to form. You have more students going on. They're all, now you also see that they, their conversations are actually diverging, right? They pick two different points from the same post to respond to. So this is what it starts to look like as students start to talk with one another about the assignment. And this is what it looked like at the end of a unit one cluster. So we did this four times over the course of the semester. This is what they came up with. Um, and so what you can see, too, is that there are ways, the blue and green are me. I wrote that for this presentation. But the students started organizing their thinking and saying, you know, these clusters are talking about this, and this is talking about this, and these are our initial understandings, um, et cetera. So this is what it looked like at the end. And this was our first unit. So what you see is that students are talking to each other, developing ideas in a variety of diff two different topics in a variety of different kinds of ways. Um, if you could read, you can't see, but all the students in this team had contributed at this point, so they've all been engaging in the discourse. So this is the first unit's discourse. Here's the second. So 
you know, a, a quick read shows that, again, it looks similar, maybe more posts than there had been previously, a little more organized. Uh, everyone had participated. They did organize their knowledge into two important themes. But I think that what's really compelling is that's not so impressive, what, or that's not the thing that shows you the learnings happen. Because if I show you what they said in their first bit of discourse, you would not be impressed. So I'm actually going to give you some handouts where maybe, I don't know if I have enough for everyone, maybe you could share with the person next to you. And at the beginning, you know the, the cluster I had struggled with the blue, um, I gave, have given you what they wrote in, the, in all of those notes, so that you can see them. And then, if you wouldn't mind sharing with a partner, um, that would be great. I'm happy to say I underestimated the size of the audience. Um, so that's what you see here is this cluster. The beginning it says early discourse. That's this cluster here from the picture. And then if you continue, you'll see a header that says later discourse. That's this circle of discourse here. They come up automatically. Knowledge forum. When you click on a note and read someone and you want to respond, you just need to uh, build on. You can pick, pick your own note and you can build on from there. So it's really simple to do. So um, what I wanted you to do is just take a couple of minutes to read through. So I don't know that you're all you know, um, experts in research methods in psychology or how to read these, but I think even if you come to this never having thought about any of these questions or using the disciplinary knowledge in any way, you'll start to see some differences in the early versus late discourse. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to read through, and then maybe we could share our observations about what you noticed from the beginning versus the end of the student discourse. And how often did you get involved in the conversation? Never. Never. Uh, so I could, we could talk a little bit more about scaffolding. I am not present in any of those posts. I did talk about what was happening in the conversation, and Glenn's going to talk to you a little bit about how we tried to give them feedback about having better conversation, but I did not insert myself at all in the conversation. Yeah. Yes? Is there something that this offers that layered forums do not, or is it just two different ways to do the same thing? I'm, I don't know what layered forums are, but that sounds like it's probably very similar. It's, okay. Yeah. It, as long as it's not just purely linear. You can apply it any which one. Yeah. Then that, I'm sure. There are other, there are other um, approaches. Um, MindMeister has done something similar. So we have not all used the same exact tool. And actually, we think the tool is irrelevant. It's just allowing students to do this together outside of class, have a space for it. So uh, can I just ask a couple of, do you have a question before we? Uh, uh, so observations. So what do you notice between, what are your observations about the quality of the conversation? Yes. At a very superficial level, it seemed like they moved from content-driven questions to method-driven questions because they learned something. Um, but at a, I think at a more important level, it seems like they're all over just asserting themselves and saying, this is true, this is true, this is true, in the right. first ones. And then they're moving to a questioning of everything. Um, so it's a little confounded, but to me it looks like they've just really transformed themselves into the kind of discourse they're having, that they're asking questions and raising questions and pointing things out, rather than just saying, asserting. Right. I almost feel uh, that after the unit one cluster, they felt we're done with the semester, right? What is the answer? The answer is absolutely media is evil, causes eating disorders. It's never good. Let's go home. We all have A's. <laughs> right? So, yeah, I think that's true. And then you see it that later on. It almost, to some degree, feels more, more tentative, right? It doesn't, the, the learning to some degree, to an naive eye might feel like you've, um, they seem less less confident or self-assured in some of their their answers, um, which we know can sometimes be a hallmark of good learning. Yeah. Uh, continuing on with that, it also feels like the latter the latter discourse, their questions are more genuine. I wouldn't necessarily say tentative; they, they still feel confident and, and informed, more informed. But these seem very genuine questions. I'm I, I'm trying to understand this. Every students are chiming in. I love the little poster one of the students had. Thanks for your patience. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Kind of a sense of social connectedness. Yeah. Yeah. We would say build on that comment. We try to use this in our language in classes too. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering to the extent that that process evolved simply from 
developing familiarity in class with each other rather than in this context. It is the function of discourse that's enabled by technology, but simply what's happening in the classroom as it progresses. Uh, a very good question. I think, you know, if you think of a real social constructivist idea of learning and understanding, these two things are intimately connected, right? Like a Vygotsky approach is that knowledge is developed in relation, in, in social relationships, in relation to, and sometimes they are at a distance, like, you know, an author of a textbook rather than a person tutoring in front of you. But the idea there is that you, um, in order for people to develop their ideas and to be pushed to their learning and new levels of understanding, it has to happen in, really, in, in a social relationship, in, co in context with ideas colliding from other people. So I think that it's hard to disentangle those two things um, perfectly, but I, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's just me admitting that early on in my teaching career, I had, I had teaching seminars, et cetera, where students got along fabulously, but I just felt like we never dug down deep enough in terms of ideas. So. They were all, there was a good feel in the room, but they wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say they had gone as far as they could with ideas and understanding. So I think they're definitely connected, and you can see that sometimes the comment made earlier about um, people kind of emotionally hijacking conversations online. You can find examples of that happening in class where it will disrupt it, but I don't know that the good um, attempts at discourse were only because they started to feel friendly. But we do try to build social relationships in, in groups and teams. And sometimes students develop a real group identity. So I've had students, um, not in this class, but in other classes where they've done projects where they call themselves for the rest of their time um, team, what? Um, I had one group that was doing something on um, stigma consciousness. They called themselves team stigma all semester long. And then even beyond, you know, they'd come and leave notes on my door. Team stigma was here. Um, or Team Superwoman was here. Um, so there is something that's really important about feeling part of a community of scholars. Um, yes, other observations? Something in written discourse that you would not get in the verbal discourse, a live discourse, and this is asynchronous, right? Yes. It's kind of happening on their own time, that they have the opportunity to reflect before they speak, and they can edit what they say before they say it. Um, so it's a lot more thoughtful method. We always hope, right? Yes, exactly. And in fact, one of our observations, because we have a faculty group who talks about using this approach, is that sometimes it really does benefit the very quiet student, the one where you feel, are they getting it? And sometimes they are the most brilliant contributors to Knowledge Forum because they have the space to feel comfortable with their ideas, um, or there's um, I don't like this term very much. Someone maybe can help me with better ones. Slow thinkers, because for me, I don't know, that somehow seems like it's a liability in some way. I actually slow responders. Slow responders, or second day responders, responders, I've heard before. Um, but there's something about asking all our students to do that. Because sometimes we have enthusiastic contributors who are totally off the mark. <laughs> um, and sometimes your most enthusiastic contributors can be that way. My Uncle Henry always said, and you think, oh gosh, here we go. <laughs> um, and so I think there's a way in which this honors that contemplative, slower, more thoughtful space. Um, yeah. Do, how many do we need to move on? Probably maybe one more comment and then we'll move on. Have you comment on the knowledge form as a tool as opposed to a kind of more traditional idea of a discussion forum and how like, this idea of having the arrows and the blocks is helps you find that like why you like that. So uh, just a couple of things. The first thing is just to get everyone engaged in the conversation. But once they get engaged and then the, the space looks more like this, and this is after they've already organized, some people are like, I get overwhelmed. There's too much going on. And so as an instructor, we'll talk about scaffolding. You might say to the students, well, what are you going to do about that? And they're like, hmm, maybe we need subheadings. Maybe we need to put those clusters that are on the same theme next to each other. Maybe we need to figure out what are the themes that we're really talking about here. So in a lot of ways, there are tools that you can use with the Knowledge Forum. There, there is what's called a rise above, where you can take all of these notes and kind of embed them underneath a note that says, here's what this cluster was all about. Here's where we started. Here's where our ideas ended. So there are some ways in which this allows students to be really self-directed and metacognitive about the discourse that they're having that you don't necessarily find. I haven't um, been able to do as successfully on Blackboard or Moodle, et cetera. 
But I don't, the tool I think for us to some degree is, is kind of almost beside the point, right? I, I'm sure there are lots of technologies you could use or even post-its on the wall if you wanted to, if you had a space to leave them up. So Lauren is gonna show us, so this is what they do outside of class, but we wanted to show you a little bit of uh, what that looks like actually in class, because we've seen some spillover effects. Okay, so before I do that, I would like to um, just go over five knowledge building principles. These are, these five knowledge building principles come from an article by Lee Chan and Alst in 2006, which is at the bottom. Um, so it's been, as, as Glenn was saying, there's been quite a bit of work in the learning sciences about um, the idea of uh, idea-centered learning and knowledge building. Um, and the idea, things that we're looking for to, that would define good discourse and, and the comments that you kind of came up with and you saw the differences between the first and the, the last uh, uh, the examples of that Patty showed you kind of fit into some of these things fit in here. So I wanna, I'm just gonna explain them very quickly then I'm gonna show you some student created videos that show them discussing, basically demonstrating knowledge building live, just so you can see what it's like. So the five knowledge building principles, first is working at the cutting edge. And this is what Patty was talking about, working at their learning edge. Um, finding knowledge gaps, inconsistencies, asking productive questions, things like that. Posing problems that push the, the knowledge, uh, the edge of the community's knowledge. Um, connecting theories to real world issues, problems or examples. These things should be on the, the site, the whatever, somewhere. Um, the second one is progressive problem solving. And basically the idea is to, that the students will show continual efforts to grapple with the problems posed by classmates. So unlike that first group where they said, okay, we're done, we can go home, we all get A's. It's like, okay, we know this, but let's go further. What's next? What, what do we still don't know? And in fact, that, that's what we do as scholars, right? We never, we never, oh yeah, that's the end of that problem. I'm done, I'm gonna quit, retire, whatever, you don't do that, you move on, right? So that's what we want our students to do. Um, collaborative effort, that one is fairly <coughs> self-explanatory, but basically you are trying to get the students to form a knowledge community. You want them to help each other out. A lot of times if a student will, early on in these knowledge forum posts, if a student says something that is confusing, or too long or dense, students just won't build on the note. And then hopefully by the end, what they've learned to do, well, first of all, hopefully that students learn not to write long notes like that. But what they, now what they do near the end is they, they'll th say things like, help me understand what you meant by this or something like that, which actually helps the original student to clarify their thoughts, helps build knowledge in the community. So that's part of collaborative knowledge building, not shying away when you don't understand something or you disagree or you think someone has a crazy idea. Um, monitoring your own understanding. Basically the idea is feeling safe enough in this community to explain what you don't understand, what you don't know, right? Allowing other people to help you with that. And then in turn helping others, which is often very hard for students to do. Um, and then finally, constructive use of authoritative sources this is my favorite one. This is the one that to me distinguishes good discourse from bad discourse. Very easy for people to express. So I teach courses in political psychology and psych of women and gender, which of course big controversial issues all the time, great knowledge questions. Um, very easy for students to express their opinions, but I don't care about their opinions. What I care about is what does the literature say? What kinds of arguments can we make to support both sides of a particular issue? Or you know, how do we understand the psychology of this? I'm a psychologist as well. Um, so using authoritative sources and then exploring where they're limited and uh, how they can support the, the knowledge building of the community. Okay, make sense? Okay, so I want you to think about these. I'll show you these videos. Okay, so this is, as I said, this is a student created video. Um, uh, I'll just let Jeff explain it to you. To focus specifically on the ways that our knowledge building um, can be applied to real life discussions and situations and we videotape ourselves having these discussions as a way to demonstrate our knowledge building skills um, that we've gained throughout the semester and apply them to in-person discussions based off of these three topics. Because okay, so this is in a political psychology class. This is, uh, you know, I actually stole these from a final project that this group created. Um, so, okay. So what they did was they, they, they had three different videos. This is one. They, they, Basically, they were interested in the question of 
what does it mean to be a feminist in 2013? And this is their own idea. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and one of the things they did was look at um, the, the Robin Thicke video, Blurred Lines, and Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball video. And then they were gonna, they're going to talk about Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus has said she's a feminist, and they're going to struggle. They're, they're struggling with an apparent contradiction. You'll see. I'm just going to show like 10 seconds of this video, and that's pretty much all you need to see. <laughs> and you'll see what the contradiction is, and you'll hear what the students say about it. I can go anywhere in this video, and it really doesn't Okay, I think that's enough. Don't you think? You get the idea? Okay. So this is what the video is about. Okay, and then here is their discussion. So remember, let's see if you can identify any of these knowledge building principles or what you what you thought is think is good or bad about this discourse. Um, this video is about five minutes long. In the three minutes, I'm going to sell that position. Is that intrinsically non feminist? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think, right. that's what I, I mean, I think that a lot of the people who say that it's intrinsically non feminist, unfortunately, come from a really paternalistic, um, kind of benevolent, hostile, but I'm sorry, benevolent, sexist perspective. Um, because a lot of it is just parents who have daughters who are telling them this is inappropriate, you should never act this way, you won't be taken seriously. It's extremely pleasant, yeah. I mean, it's and there's a huge double standard for the way that men can act, the way that women can act. Even though men can be perceived as being very sexualized, even with keeping their clothes off, even when they take them off, they're not ever judged nearly as harshly. It's just considered kind of, oh, he's such a cute, silly guy who tried to do that thing. Wasn't that funny? He's so hot. It's never the same level of judgment. Mm -hmm. It also brings up to the question of third wave feminism, um, which is basically about that, you know, it's like about saying that women are basically what women do is their choice and their power to make those choices. Um, but not idea. Yeah. Right, but then that's also can be really problematic because uh, one of their choices negatively affect other women, and then how could that possibly be a problem? Right. And it's so the consequences. I love that. Yeah. Interesting because there's a time that we and the media, and this is a big shift article in the medical class that talks about there's this one part which I find very interesting, which is about feminists or about the people who openly identify. Feminist, a strong mm -hmm. um, affinity for feminism, or less likely to be affected by self objectification. Right, self objectification. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they, because it has less of an effect on them, they can look at this video and say, you know, that's fine because it's, it's not going to change the way I act, it's not going to change my perception of myself watching this figure prancing around. Um, but what about her? What if she is? Like, she has come out and said that she identifies as a feminist. But so, is her behavior detrimental when you don't identify as a feminist? Or is it detrimental because it has nothing to do with the way the women are perceiving it, but the way that the men are perceiving it? Right. Or, and, and like the public in general. I mean, yeah. yeah. Group, right? okay. I think the question is whether she is helping to move the movement forward. Or a couple of things I'm thinking about. One thing is that is it really a fair assessment of her to analyze her? Roles and feminist or boys in the economy and such. And she worked in an industry where, like, we don't even know what role she had in creative processes. Like, there's mm -hmm. people, um, executives, etc., who make these choices. But one of the things I was also thinking about, regardless of that aspect, is could she have made the same point without making her clothes off? Right. Like, well, I mean, she is saying, like, you can do whatever you want to do. But I think the fact that there's a male actor on the Okay, so one of the things I forgot to say to you was, um, so, the, so Frankie refers to benevolent sexism, that's one of the articles I read. Um, third wave feminists, they, they read articles about, um, you know, like, uh, I'm not a feminist, but women who, who, I, who are egalitarian but don't take on the label, so they've kind of referenced some of these things. Did you make any other observations seeing this? Yeah. Maybe it was a video previous to this, but it really kind of generated a question, an idea for me. The student had mentioned something about being involved in this online or asynchronous discussion, and then something about practice for class. It got yes. me to thinking about the extent to which the 
say asynchronous is scaffolding a certain mindset, habit of mind, and behavioral approach in class discourse. So I think that, that should be really interesting. Absolutely. And I would say that what you see in the video with the references to the articles and so on um, is something that does transfer over to class because they have to do that in, they, and they have the time to do it, right? That's the other thing. It helps the shy students, but it also, we tell the students, when you go on Knowledge Forum, have your articles next to you. Or when you're reading the articles, underline things that you might want to talk about and actually cite those. I tell my students, take direct quotes from the articles because the comments are so much better, the, and the conversations are much better when people take direct quotes and then try to unpack what the author was saying in, the, in a particular article. And I think it does develop a habit of mind. So are you as instructors using it to scaffold intentionally in class discourse? Yes. I would say we're, we're using it to try to support the students' ability to build new knowledge together. And we think it's a really valuable tool um, it, that has the effect of improving in-class discussion, but it also, the out-of-class discussion is enormously useful as well. Yeah. We have friends up kind of saying with these particular topics maybe, um, or maybe in the beginning it says, the answer's out there, why are you making us do all this work? Is it, hasn't, every, hasn't somebody already done the research and says that this is a bad thing? Or, I mean, well, okay, I'm going to play you one last video, and this will build on what Patty showed you. This is a really short one. This is kind of their, this is their conclusion. So throughout the process of making this video, I think we didn't really come to any concrete, tangible, unanimous conclusions. However, what we did do is we improved upon our knowledge in the subject, and we have a greater wealth of knowledge from incorporating these five principles. That was our original goal. And so that way, I think this project has proved very valuable, not only to our personal understandings of what it means to be feminists in 2013, but also it's contributed a lot to our group's knowledge and our group understanding of the topic. It really makes me think back to at the beginning of the semester when we looked at the Groupthink article, and we looked at um, basically why brainstorming isn't efficient, but why kind of having good debate in a group is something that's really important. But in the group, people need to be People need to feel comfortable enough to kind of to really share what they're thinking, but then also to accept criticism and to kind of consider things in different ways. And I think that for us, feminism is such a personal topic. Talking about our experiences with sexism, talking about our reactions to to women in the media and the way that the media portrays women. And I think that it was something that really brought us much closer together, being able to kind of share our personal reactions and personal experiences but in the safe confines of talking about it through an academic lens and using the terms that we learned in this class, we found that having the sources to be able to use as reference, as a point of reference for all of us, was so helpful when this is a topic that people feel so differently about, that even a group of, of women who have fairly homogenous um, political identities still had so many different things to say about, and that was extremely meaningful, and I think that that's something that we will always kind of keep with us after having this conversation. So, so just to, I just want to emphasize the first thing that um, Taylor said was that we didn't come to any concrete unanimous conclusions. One thing I've seen in my classes over and over again is they start out thinking they know the answer, and by the end, it's success if they say, we don't know the answer, right? I mean, it's kind of funny to think that way, but that's really what at least I want my students to do. I want them to be able to see both sides of an issue. I want them to be able to see shades of gray. I want them to be able to, to be open-minded and, and handle this as it comes up. Yeah. Uh, going from the in-class version to the kind of clustered forum version, do you think in the in-person you tend to see any like identity foreclosure, any regression towards kind of the, the, the mean idea as what she said, these are very, very personal topics and so they tend to homogenize their views a little bit, whereas the forums allow for a little more contrary thought? Well, I would say, as someone who teaches in potentially very controversial issues, I all it's what Frankie said, it's all about intellectualizing it. It's like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what your own personal opinion is. I don't think that's actually relevant in here, but let's understand why white supremacists believe that they are a beleaguered group. And let's compare the way they feel to the way, they, the way women feel, feminists feel, about their position. Let's talk about that in an intellectual way. It doesn't matter to me what your own personal opinions are. 
So we can have conservatives, we can have liberals, we can have, you know, and that, that feels safe to them, I think, or a little safer, not totally safe. Yeah. I was wondering, when you were talking about collaborative effort as one of the goals, and you talked about some stuff that we really saw in the, in the um, handout about um, the kind of let me help you out language, and the, um, you know, the sort of, um, hmm, I think this is kind of predictable, or kind of confused. Um, I heard in the, in the video, I heard moments of helping each other out with language. Yes. But I didn't hear that kind of ability to pause and and then you'd really be able to say, you know, I'm not sure I'm understanding you correctly, or that there was a there was a sort of feeling of urgency if I'm going to get my voice in. I think that I think, and I think that's a product of this quick video, and they're editing and they're making sure each person got on the video because it was it was a final project. So that that's probably what you're seeing there. Um, it's probably true in the classroom that there's a sense of urgency as well. I mean, you've all seen that as well, but as Patty was saying, the, the students that are the quick responders often talk whether they have anything to say or not. And so I think that's a problem in classroom discussion in general. And I think, you know, other people have used tools like small group pairs, talking, that kind of helps alleviate that. So it doesn't get rid of that. Yeah. We, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I should go to the other side of the room first. How do you or do you not reference these out of class forums in the classrooms? Well, one of the things we all love about Knowledge Forum or these sorts of discussions is we always say we get to peek inside the students' minds. It, it really, you really get a very clear idea of the way they're thinking. It's something that they don't talk about much in K-12 education, but for us, that is so valuable. We get to see where the misconceptions are, where people are really struggling, where the hot topics are. And we often, you know, often will be lurkers. We'll read lots of the, the, the comments, and then it'll come up in class. So it's more spontaneous. Sometimes people will do it deliberately. I was wondering um, how you evaluate all of this. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. That's one we, we struggle with because it can be very time consuming. Um, do we want to answer that now, or do you want to wait? Save we'll yeah, save that for the end. We'll, we'll do that, that. Do that in the end. Okay. One more comment, and then we, I think we need to move on to Glenn. Yeah. Building on. Okay. Building on. I love Woo! it. Good <laughs> job. You get an A for the day. All right. Um, you were talking about the group dynamics yes. in, in discussion, and that sense of urgency and quick responders. The students mentioned something about learning. Uh, what it means to be a feminist in 2013. Uh, learning about feminist practice. Uh, what do you think, or do you have them try feminist approaches to discussion, for example, or discussion dynamics in, in classes, so that they would intentionally pay attention to their quick responder uh, roles and, and draw out these sort of sole responders in the conversation? Well, they, in my classes, and this has nothing to do with knowledge form, but um, they're every student is required to speak at least one time during the class. And, and you know, we all have students who have trouble with that. And we, I tell them if, if they have trouble with that, we'll figure out a strategy. Oftentimes, I'll call them, I'll, I'll say, Joanne, do you have a comment? You know, or something like that. So we'll start like that. Um, I, my, my class discussions aren't that quick paced. So that, that is definitely an artifact of this particular um, Domain, but it, you know, it's something I think a lot of us think about in in class discussions. So I don't know the answer to that, really. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we're going to move on. Len is going to talk now about scaffolding good uh, discourse. I'll let you go. Okay. Well, scaffolding this is really tough. But first of all, I said we want them to do it without us, but we have to help them do it. Um, we also know going into it, you saw some discourse, students are not good at this. When they start out, there's lots of exchanging ideas, there's lots of people too scared to put their ideas out in public. This is a really challenging thing for our students, so it's a challenge for them. Um, also, they spent their entire life doing really well in school, that's why they're at the colleges that we teach at, and suddenly this is changing all the rules, where no longer is it okay to sit there and kind of take things in and do well in tests. Now suddenly you have to actually take initiative and so forth. So we find some of the students just love it from day one, 
And some of the students are terrified. Some of the students are resentful. The fact that suddenly you're not doing, you're jumping all this money from me to do all the work. What's that all about? <laughs> so we hear it's all different ranges of it. However, instead of these things, we do it because we see really powerful learning taking place in the classroom. The lesson, so what's there to help us? Well, um, Lauren Ray showed you, basically you have these five principles of what was a good knowledge building discourse. There's other different versions of that. There are lots and lots of research papers on it. And there you go, that's it. So basically, here's how you do it. Figure out what good discourse really looks like and then be an adaptive expert in the classroom to make sure it happens. That's pretty much what the pedagogy is. And, and if you want to see examples of it, there are examples that you can look at all about K-12. The only examples about how to support this in the classroom, the undergraduate level, comes from things that we've published. We've published a number of papers on it. So it's really a case of adaptive expertise. I'm going to show you a couple things just to scratch the surface of it. And this would be from my class. Well, actually, here, here's the main character, um, not quite as big as Miley Cyrus, but this is a tornado that came through Massachusetts four years ago. And this was a really big deal in our area. And you see it's crossing the Connecticut River, hanging into the city of Springfield, where it killed three people, hundreds of buildings were wrecked or partially destroyed. This is a really big deal in the, in the Pioneer Valley. And so I'm going to be, use this in, in my knowledge building. And so... The class that I'm teaching is engineering mechanics. It's all about forces deforming objects and so forth. And so how do we get students started on knowledge building? As Patty showed you, she actually starts out giving them a question. And there's advantage and disadvantage. The giant advantage of that is you get them from day one working on a really great question which relates to the class. I'm kind of the other extreme, which is let's just jump off a cliff and hope things are going to work. And so what I want them to do is come up with their own questions and advantages to having their own questions. And so what I see happening is I need to see them in a situation where, because they, they know nothing about engineering mechanics when they start, I don't get them into a situation where they emotionally really care. Our experience is knowledge building does not work well when students are doing it for an A. Knowledge building works well when they really care about something. They need real problems that they really care about. So, for example, what I did is um, we hopped on a bus and we did a tour um, one year of the city of Springfield with a tornado hit. And students went around, they observed things, but the bomb are two pictures they took of, of the detail. They took lots of details. Um, for example, they noticed things like, hey, look at this. All the street, the street signs were knocked over. They all failed the bottom. Why did they fail in the middle? Why at the top? I wanted to observe things very, very carefully. And I also brought in people who survived the tornado, who talked about the impacts of their community, what it was like. And so pretty much my goal was to have every student pretty much crying their eyes out you know, by this experience, that this was something really important they were involved in, it, because that will get you through all sorts of trouble that will happen later if they really care, uh, passionately care about this. Once they did this, then they got onto Knowledge Forum, and they then posted their initial ideas, observations, and so forth, and they started formulating questions, they debated that. So probably about one week, they spent talking about what they observed, and they started formulating questions. And eventually, you see groups coalesce around the questions, and there, in this case, I had like 45 students. We had five major questions, probably about eight, nine students per question that are working on these issues. Um, here are two example questions from that year when I did it. You can read these. And one thing you'll notice is the word why. Um, questions that involve the word why are probably a good place to be. And so I even told the students that, and so why show up a lot. And, um, so if you want to answer this question, the first one, you have to learn a whole lot about mechanics before you can start doing that. So the idea is that it should be a question which you need to learn and, and progress. And so also, this is their initial question. The thing that shocked students was some students had really terrible initial questions. And after a while, they came up with much better questions, and they were really sad because they were stuck with their original terrible question. And it was amazing. <laughs> The lack of agency in our students, I mean, it just blows my mind. And so from the day one, I said, I don't care what your question is. And so eventually they catch on to this. Wow, I actually have power in this classroom. So for example, this very first one, the same location one, this group split up into two different directions. You know, one was very interested in the idea of, well, is it different if it's an earthquake? Are earthquakes and tornadoes different? How they load a building? Another one went to the area of biomimicry. And so pretty much I don't care where they go. The only rule was it has to be about mechanics. Um, the second question is a really interesting question because I'm lucky enough to be with a few people who teach engineering at Liberal Arts College, which is my dream of my life to teach in this environment, which is it's not just doing math and science, it's doing math and science to serve people. And so that's a really big part of engineering. 
As we start to get into why the building codes protect people in Springfield, almost all the knowledge building questions gets into these wonderful liberal arts questions about engineering. Well, it's because people don't want to spend that money. So here you're an engineer. The very first thing in code of ethics is to protect the, the, the people. Safety of the, of the people is number one. You also have a bunch of people who don't want to have tornado-proof houses, which will protect them. And so there's lots of engineering questions to do with risk. And so anyway, these are initial questions that often led not, in, not only to better questions, but into really interesting questions that cuts students to start exploring questions that engineers don't normally get into or don't get into easily. So this is my number one way of supporting the discourse. We call it KB Talk. And so for about a half hour every two weeks, I would meet with groups. And, and they really didn't need me later in the semester, but for the first month or two, it was really valuable. Where I would get together, what I would try to do is, what I want them to have is a meta discourse. So we need knowledge building groups that talk about the discourse. You know, well, are we making progress? What are we trying to do? What can we do differently? Those groups do way better than groups that don't do that. So what I want to do is model meta discourse. So my goal was pretty much to raise questions which got them to this point. And so I was constantly asking questions like, you know, so how's it going? You know, what are you going to do next? What are your knowledge gaps? And after a little while, pretty much I wasn't needed. About halfway through the semester, they really don't need me. They start doing meta discourse themselves. Um, some examples, um, things like a, a powerful tool we found was just calling something a half-formed thought. Um, so, for example, if you're really scared of posting, if you say, well, here's a half-formed thought, that means you're free to say anything and no one can laugh at you because it's a half-formed thought. And, and so these are the kind of things that we talk about. Another example is Lawrence talked about is the importance of having authoritative uh, resources. And so if you look at the discourse in most of my groups, it starts out by saying, I think this, I think this, I think this. And the good thing is students on their own start to hate that. Like, I don't really care what you think. You know, <laughs> they, 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 they get the fact that that's really wrong. On their own, they start talking about having authoritative sources. I'm just kind of there to keep, be a callous and move things along more quickly. And after a little while, they'll start doing things like, well, here's a great source, URL. Here's a great source. And after a little while, they start to hate that. It's like, geez, nothing I hate more than having 20 posts up there all of them say, go to this URL, read a whole long paper, and try to figure out why it's relevant. And so again, so I said, well, how do you feel about this? Because if I don't say how you feel about this, initially, they'll just hate it and be grumpy. And so again, what I'm trying to do is you need to talk about your discourse to be an effective knowledge building group. And eventually, they get to the point where not only do they have a URL with a little summary of what it's about, but the final step they get to use this class would be that, hey, how about you also process this authoritative source how does this make the, the conversation go forward? So pretty much my job is to help them get to these powerful ideas of being an effective knowledge worker. Um, a term that came out of our discussions with our faculty group is going whole hog. So you can just dip your toe in a little bit and maybe spend you know, three days on this and so forth. Some of us allow us to take over their classes. I was one of those, so I went whole hog. And what that means is it really affects everything I do in the class. And so if you teach engineering mechanics, the way I was taught, what is normally taught nowadays, is you just solve lots and lots and lots of problems like this. And this would be a great problem to learn torque. If force is pushing on something, it's a tendency to cause it to rotate. And there's huge problems with this. For example, this is great as long as someone else comes along and takes every complicated situation in the world and turns into something like this. <laughs> However, for engineering, really what you're doing is your main job is to take the complicated situations in the world and turn into that. After that, you have computer programs. They solve everything. And so we pretty much avoid in engineering mechanics classes around the country the only important part you're supposed to be doing. And so what this allows me to do is I can really see, as, as maybe Perry Lawrence said, I can see inside their head now. I, I, through their knowledge building discourse, I can see their ideas. I can see their misconceptions. Some students think the air has no mass, for example. All sorts of things come up, and we can then actually start addressing. So the class can be all about them. And so instead of teaching torque from an example like the one here on, on the left, I can now teach torque by looking at, uh, looking at knowledge building situations where they're looking at why do mobile homes slip over versus sliding? You know, why is this, why, why this mode of failure? And so what I can now do is teach the exact same concepts, but now looking at a mobile home and how it's affected by a tornado. So really, and, and the, thing, the difference is if I teach the one on the left, it's just not exciting and there's giant issues of transfer in terms of is it really valuable learning, is it deep learning? where I teach it through the one on the right, suddenly I am their best friend because they're passionately involved in this question. I'm actually there helping them directly on the question. So it really changes the dynamics in the classroom, I think. Um, finally, Patty and I, we each have one slide and then we'll have time for more discussion. Um, 
we are trying to measure some understanding. It's a tough thing because we're really talking about is deep learning and measuring deep learning is a really challenging thing. But we do we have a lot more than this, but here's just some highlights of it. Um, this comes from my class. And what we did is we asked the students a question at the end of class. And the question was, what is the role and responsibility of the teacher in advancing knowledge in this class? All right, and it's, it's open, they can write anything they want, they can write paragraphs, whatever they want. That's the question we asked. We asked that question one year when there was no knowledge building, and then the following two years with knowledge building, and then we kind of categorized the response and so forth and see how they changed. And so one thing that we know about deep learning is when students are actually intentionally trying to learn deeply, they, they're, they'll be much more successful. So one of our goals is to change student conceptualization of what learning actually is and what their role is, what the teacher's role is. And so we find out is in the year before knowledge building, number one thing my job was explain clearly. And very few people thought that guiding students to self direct their own learning was important at all. But then after knowledge building, we started doing this, it completely reversed itself. So we believe this has a powerful impact on how students view the role of the teacher and themselves. And I think there's a lot of evidence showing that some cognitive type of thinking is really supportive of deep learning. I think Patty has one more slide, and then we'll... Approach. Yeah, I do. One of the things, so far, um, Glenn and Lauren have talked about how we get to see inside students' heads, and they talked about how exciting and fun that was. I have been appalled by what I've sometimes seen inside my students' heads. The first time I looked at this course, I thought, you're all agreeing with one another. We, this is not good logic. Why isn't anyone taking a step back and seeing it? So there have been a number of times where I felt like students are getting it really wrong in their conversations. Um, and so we've been worried that, that in essence, wait, are, are we somehow um, tricking ourselves that these conversations are happening? Are they having the impact that we want them to have? Can we say that our students, for example, are learning the traditional content of the course just as well? if we're only having them engage in discourse where they end up being tentative and see black and whites on both sides. There's a disconcerting sense. So um, I actually uh, serendipitously had all my final lab reports for my research methods before I went whole hog with knowledge building. And I had the year I had done it with the group I showed you earlier. And so uh, what I did was I actually pulled their labs and I coded their labs for um, some of the big concepts in psychology, and in particular the four big validities we talk about in my class, internal validity, external validity, construct, et cetera. And I graded their labs on how well they got each concept in relation to that particular data set. And before I used the knowledge building approach, the traditional approach of the light blue, um, on average they, got, they spoke about those four big ideas, about one and a half of them they had done well on average in that final lab report. Whereas in the knowledge building group, when I graded theirs, they, again, not perfect here, but on average about three of them had been particularly well done. The thing that's interesting about this is that in the knowledge building class, one of the things that I jettisoned was them writing lab reports because I didn't have time. So instead I had them talking on knowledge building. So this was their first lab report, formal lab report they'd ever done in an APA style lab report, whereas my traditionally taught students have done it three times previously. So they actually had a tremendous amount of practice doing it, but I think it's one of those things where they checked the box, but the ideas weren't quite developing in the same, in the same way. So um, I uh, looked at this as kind of some of the compelling data, but we're working together as a group to say, what would we expect to see? How would we measure this kind of deep engagement and understanding? Are we giving things up in terms of learning goals and outcomes by taking this approach? Um, et cetera. So that's um, this is some of the preliminary data, but we're still engaged as a pretty vibrant faculty group talking about what are compelling learning outcomes and are we getting there. But I think we, we have time for which five minutes. Five, five minutes. minutes. Okay, I guess we have five minutes for questions. Yes. I always get very excited when I see a new piece of software that would look like fun to use, and then I think, what does it cost? Um, it is open source. Yes. It's open source. Mm -hmm. It's free now. Oh, it, it wasn't when I was looking it up. That was, that, it sounded like there were site licenses and things like that. Maybe it's on your server. It's different from when it's on their server. Yeah, so Glenn, you will well, help us with this. It's complicated, unfortunately. Yeah. But there used to be a version that cost like $1,000 for a lifetime license. And that's what we're showing you here. There's a new version out, which is open source. And we're a test site for it. I'm not sure if it's available. That's probably, it's part of the handout, right? Yeah, so, so in the materials, the materials that are supposed to be on the site, and if they're not, we'll make sure they are. Jenny said she would put them on. 
the last page of our PDF is actually a guide. It, we, we created a site, a database just for this present, this uh, conference. So it's, it says how to use Knowledge Forum, and it's got the link that you can go to. It tells you how to become a new user, and you can try it out. Right now it's just a blank page, and you can just fiddle around with it. Um, if you want uh, to actually try to use it, and you could probably email one of us, yes. and we'll... Yeah. We'll figure it out. We'll help you figure it out. We'll connect you to. We'll connect you with the people. That yeah, that know knowledge. the people in the know. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Can we go back to the question of how you evaluate? Yeah, that's right. Gosh, well, we avoided that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> that's really um, difficult. Right, right. Uh, we spend a lot of time. We have a whole variety of different approaches. Some of us don't really evaluate it at all. We talk about it, but we don't necessarily grade it. So. Some of us, um, I go in and I actually write uh, sometimes for the group and then sometimes individually I write, a, I write a qualitative assessment like I would a paper and say, here's what I've seen you contributed, here's an example of you know, collaborative engagement, here's an example of really good monitoring of understanding where I didn't think you did very well was progressive problem solving and here's a space where I could imagine it would have happened but it didn't happen. So trying to scaffold and provide them feedback on how they're doing um, and then giving them some kind of grade. Sometimes we have students self-reflect on those things. Um, sometimes uh, we don't grade it because sometimes I'll just say here's where you improve your understanding. Basically this is studying for your unit exam. If you work here and you can do this well, this is basically practice for the kinds of messy questions I'm going to give you on your take home. So here's some lab data. Discuss this lab data. What does it mean? Do you have validity? And then I'm going to give you new lab data for your take home. So if you try really hard here, then you should do well on the exam. So it's almost that it they don't need to be graded on that because I could just grade the exam piece. Um, but and I'll just I'll yeah. add one more point. Um, I tend to this is I've taught I've used knowledge form in all sorts of different classes, including research methods, and I've gone back and forth about different ways. And I've found for myself that the, there are a couple of things that that are hallmarks of good discourse. Well, first thing is you have to make sure that you there's there are tools on knowledge form to see how many times people have participated. And one of the things that really um, usually is correlated highly with good discourse is if a student has returned to the same thread multiple times. Because it's very difficult to improve your knowledge if you, if you dive in, say something, you, and then swoop out, and then do something else, and then swoop out, because there's no, there's no con continuity there, right? So if you see people coming back again and again, okay, that doesn't totally get at the quality, but that's a sign that, that, that that's probably good discourse. The use of authoritative sources is another one that tends to be a hallmark. It doesn't mean it's 100% correlated, but it tends to be one of the clear signals to me. And, you know, and if that's missing, it is usually an indication that the discourse isn't as good. We Maybe. all share, the only thing I would say, do we all share those five principles, or there are 12 also that have been boiled down to those five? We share them. We say at the beginning, this is what good discourse looks like. And at the beginning, they, when we, they self-reflect, they sometimes say, we did a great job, and you read, and they did not do a good job. And so a lot of times correcting their notions of what it means to be progressively problem solving, et cetera. Um, but we do share those characteristics with them so they know up front. I think it takes a while for them to practice it to know when they've truly gotten it or, or have it gotten it. And Glenn, I think Glenn, and then one more question. Hold on, Glenn. Here's, here's the extremist point of view on evaluation. Would be that I think this is the most meaningful grade I give on anything in the agency the grade. If you look at the research on transfer and deep learning, what it says is you really put students in a situation where they need to go and actually learn new things and, and get involved in discourse. And here we have a case where they do that for an entire semester, and I get to see inside their head how they're using ideas and so forth. Um, I have never had a situation where I have so much information, and I've never had one student complain about their grade, but this is the one case where I think what we're measuring really matters, and I think I am seeing tra transparent what their thinking is as opposed to a few numbers written on paper and so forth. So I just believe I have no problem knowing who is doing a good job and a bad job. I've had no complaints. So these are the great conversations we have because Glenn would say you don't need a final product at the end of the semester because this is the measure of learning. Why have them write a paper? Just look at their discourse. Some of us have a different approach. It depends. We've tried all different ways, et cetera. We don't, we don't all agree in all that, the aspects, but Glenn makes a really compelling case. I haven't quite been able to give up you know, the final <laughs> something, the final final of some kind. Um, one more yeah. question. I know we're. Well, I just wanted to, to 
contribute to this uh, because it actually sounds like this is one of those rare cases where a discussion could be open really well to a rubric because it seems like there are five key things you yes. want to have. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your five categories are, but it seems like the number of posts, the number of different clusters they talk about, the, number, the substantive nature of each interaction that they're not just saying, hey, great job, you know, yes. they're actually bringing in ideas and key concepts. And you could have just a little chart and a check, and then that could push them to post more often, to add more links, to score mm -hmm. resources, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, just keep it vibrant. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.